everyone, welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. My name is Josh Davis. If you'd like to uh, find us during our live tapings on Monday nights, you can find us at youtube.com slash user slash Cur of Anarchy at 9 o'clock Eastern. And then I take that, add graphics, edit it down, um, and I post it to YouTube at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues, and that shows up at 3 o'clock Eastern on Wednesdays. So please check that out. And if you have any comments during our live shows, please find my thread uh, at uh, facebook.com uh, slash groups slash cur of anarchy. And uh, just we'll take any questions or comments during the show. And uh, so, yeah, I have a couple guests for, uh, for tonight. Uh, I've got Sheppy Morgan. How are you doing, Sheppy? Doing all right. How about yourself? Yeah, good to see you. I haven't seen you in about a month or something. Yeah, it's been a little while. Good stuff. And uh, Michael is back, and his page is Don't Tread on Anyone, uh, Michael Freeman. How are you doing, Michael? Josh, I'm doing well. How are you, man? Very good. Uh, so how's the hat doing? Awesome hat. Uh, yeah, it sits pretty cunning, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, um, good to see you both. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, just a generalization about uh, freedom in the world, I guess. Kind of a general concept um, about uh, liberty, um, where the, uh, the origins of this concept really lie. Um, I think that they sort of started in the Enlightenment and um, that concept kind of flooded uh, the colonies at the time. Um, of course, this concept has been thought about over the millennia, really, but um, it really took a big hold in America, um, and they tried to put it into a government, but you can't really do that from an anarchist per perspective, at least. Um, so, you know, I guess it's the sentiment that I'm talking about here. It's the uh, the concepts of it, but really the um, the uh, romanticism behind it. And um, it's not so much about what we see today. Um, in a, basically, what we see is tyranny kind of flooding the market, as it were, right now. Um, and I think the only way to get out of it is a currency collapse or economic collapse in a way. But um, if we held on to the sentiment at least and tried to figure out really what's going on, why all of this is happening, then maybe we can uh, come through with, uh, I don't want to say even a small government because that will just take off into an empire just as we are right now. But um, maybe we can bring back that sentiment, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll start with Sheppy. What do you think? Uh, can you uh, elaborate on what I'm saying at all? What, what are your thoughts? Well, basically how I see it right now is the only way that the state is going to disappear is if it becomes obsolete. Um, we're we're doing we're taking massive strides towards that. I mean, within the last forty years, we've got uh, cryptocurrency. We're we're making good steps toward towards you know a, an actual you know um, tangible stateless society. But I, I I really don't see that happening at least in any preferable way until we get to that point. Right. Like, the only way you can prefer it is to have it obsolete altogether and for people to be totally enlightened. Well, not necessarily enlightened, but, you know, have technologies right. in place that, you know, can 
take the uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, take the role of government, so to speak. Like you know, protection, um, conflict resolution, that kind of thing. The the traditional things that people look for from government that it does so terribly. You know, we we just need to continue on this path of building systems to replace that with something better. <coughs> right. Uh, yeah, Michael, what do you say? Sure. Um, well, I personally think that government has been obsolete since, at very least, the agricultural revolution. You know, I think the entire formation of, whether it's factions or tribes, whatever, the, the, the in, initial purpose was, was food and survival. You know, we need to band together in order to kill this bear in order to, f to feed the tribe. Um, once the agri agricultural revolution hit, I, I think that was deemed unnecessary and the perversion and hallucin hallucination of Augustus, you know, continued and, and increased. Um, to add to your initial, your OP, <laughs> um, you know, I think that this has been a, a consistent idea throughout all of, you know, since the formation of the idea of governance. Um, you know, Locke or Frederick Nietzsche or Lysander Spooner, Henry David Thoreau, even to nowadays Stefan Molyneux or whatever celebritarian you want to bring up, um, in, the, in the philosophical um, arena, public arena, I think been brought up, maybe sometimes um, depressed or oppressed or held back, whatever, but I think it's been a consistent idea since people started, you know, grouping together. Right, and uh, the way you're saying grouping together is the forceful grouping? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I don't. I mean even voluntary tribes forming in order to, to sustain the survivability of, of said tribe. I'm pretty, I don't know this, I'm, I'm speculating horribly here, but I'm pretty sure that when that was happening, there was the one Joshua would like, maybe we don't need to, to group like, okay, maybe, maybe I'm going too far back when I'm talking feudal and, and, and tribes, but once the agricultural revolution hits and once food is... You don't need to hunt. I'm pretty sure that there's the, the Joshua Davis off to the side. He's like, you know, I'm not sure that this is the best idea. I'm not sure that we need to collectivize any more than we already have, at least. I think fundamentally right. it's always been a present idea. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think there are good parts to grouping, of course. Um, I mean, that's why we do it in the first place. Um, I, I, I guess my problem is the government... Uh, it, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with a tribe, um, really, um, because... Um, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, I guess. <laughs> it, it's tough, because uh, the one thing that seems to have worked or been um, um, brainwashed into our heads. The one thing uh, is government, and it's the one thing that is coercive. It's, it's the strangest thing. Like, people um, uh, just, I, I guess, get brainwashed or really actually believe it. Uh, um, when you're talking about a tribe, it is still forceful, but there was it was more communal and uh, smaller, and people actually knew what, uh, the difference between right and wrong for uh, each instance of uh, aggression, or um, you know what I'm saying. At least, at least the tribe had a purpose. Current government does not. Right. Agreed. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's really succinct. That's uh, I've never thought of that before. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, like uh, when you, but the problem is, 
it's still a collective. Um, and I think there are problems with it in that, um, I, I guess, like a chief, for example. If, if you had a chief, um, they were the smart men of that, um, that group. I would um, call them the strong men of that group. The guy, with sure. the, the guy with the biggest stick. Right. Or the awesomest hat. Yeah. <laughs> Shiny, <laughs> shiny, right? Right. <laughs> um, so I, I just think that, uh, yeah, they carry a big stick, right. But um, they uh, were meant to know a lot. Uh, they went through a lot. In, uh, they only became the chief in, in their very elder years. You know what I mean? Um, So, I don't know, I guess there's a lot to gain if you're in politics at a young age. Uh, there's a lot to gain and um, you just go there for your own sake. And when you're a chief, uh, you have, uh, you don't necessarily have nothing to lose, it's just um, you don't care about yourself so much, maybe. Uh, is that the right concept? Would I you think, agree with that? I think when it comes down to a, a tribe or a, you know, whatever tribe that the um, <laughs> constituents, for lack of a better word, didn't have the time to be thinking, wait a second, does this guy really have authority over me? Because they were too busy, you know, scrounging for food 18 hours a day and trying to find shelter and, and, and things like that. And, and survival came before absolutely anything else. And politics was, was just so minuscule in, in the scheme of survival that it probably wasn't on the front of people's minds. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of hard to philosophize when, you know, you're fearing for your life. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> And we're, we're talking what, thousands and thousands of years ago, so I'm completely just pulling this, this out of the back of my head. And making Not it even that. Like, 300 years ago, it, like, there were still, the majority of people were, you know, struggling to survive. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. That's not long ago. And quite honestly, I think there are still uh, tribes, as it were, in South America right now, or Africa, though not so much, of course, but uh, they still exist. Sure. Um, yeah, but I, that makes perfect sense, yeah. Um, so politics <coughs> was um, a good invention at the time back in Greece 2,000 plus years ago, correct? But um, up until, uh, so your argument is up until the agricultural revolution. I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. At that point, I think, I think the key, the key to survival is food, maybe warmth. Um, yeah, I think once the agro rev hit, the, the the necessity for people to hunt and gather all day long is is gone, and you don't need a, a, a tribal leader at that point. If, if you're able to get your food, if you're able to, okay, and let's not even talk about the Industrial Revolution or, or anything like that. Once all these things happen, the, the need for central control is gone. The, the reason that central control, in my humble opinion, was implemented in the first place was order, in order to, to uh, you know, help you... Um, um, to, to get the necessities that you need to survive. I think once these certain um, societal things happened, it just more and more becomes more and more obsolete at a an increasing, a seriously increasing rate. Oh, yeah, definitely. Internet alone, uh, of all of the things that make government obsolete, Internet is, is the biggest one. Government, yeah, is right. government is dead, in my opinion. This is killing it, quick. Yeah, agreed. I'm, I'm willing to bet that the three of us are only anarchists because of the internet, and maybe two or three years ago, we were not. Yeah. 
That's true. I, uh, I like, actually, that. yeah, when it comes to me, I became uh, a minarchist or a libertarian, you know, a small libertarian or whatever, um, back uh, in 2008, 2009. Uh, you know, I explored. I, yeah, I explored. Um, uh, you know, the Democrats and Republicans, and uh, I was I was into politics for a little bit, and then uh, that collapse hit, and the bailouts happened, and I noticed that um, you know Obama and McCain were both voting for it uh, for the bailouts at the same at the same time, and I'm like, wow, that's just not right, and the, so Ron Paul happened, and I became a libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so after after 2011 or whatever, I I was listening to Steph and uh, Adam Kokesh, and uh, yeah, I became a an anarchist, and uh, it's just outright obvious to me, you know, it, <laughs> we should. We, we don't need this stuff. But yes, it, re it required the internet for me. I needed that internet to find out who I actually was. I think I always thought this way, but I never really thought I thought this way. You know what I'm saying? You, didn't, not... put the, uh, you didn't put the pieces together until you, know, you had a name for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how I was a, a punk rock as a kid in high school, and uh, a punk rocker, rather, and... I always just wanted to, like, you know, flick my teachers off and tell my mom to fuck herself, sorry, to go screw herself, etc. And I never was able to put it together until, like, like you said about Kokesh, you know, I heard him say the word voluntarism, and I watched one episode of his show, and boom, I was an anarchist. I didn't, I didn't do the six-month thing like everybody else. Uh, it took me, like, two years, three yeah. years from, yeah. Stefan uh, had that video about you... Are on a farm, and it's <laughs> you know what I mean. No, the way you say "you" like that is spot on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was a uh, like a a Ron Paul libertarian for like a week. Oh, good for you, good for you. But it it starts from there, I think, for most people. I was also like an Alex Jones constitutionalist for getting on a year. So. Yeah, I was there too. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But I, I couldn't stand. Uh, it, I was into Alex Jones for about probably two months, and um, it, you know it was just mostly sensational, just like MSNBC. And um, I switched from. I saw Adam Kokesh on on Alex Jones' show during the whole armed march thing, and that made me watch his show. And and the second I watched Adam's show, I realized that like when I watched Alex Jones' show, I was angry and afraid, and you know all right. this crazy stuff. When I watched yeah. Adam's show, I was laughing and making jokes and having fun, having a good time. Right, I, right. Conservative constitutionalism was was miserable for me, where anarchy is hilarious, and I have a blast doing it. I love the events. I love everything about it. I have, I'm smiling all the time. I'm not, I'm not ever hiding under my bed and, you know, running away from flashes in my, <laughs> when cars drive by my house. Well, I I get I get some of the sentiment of the Constitution. I get it, um, but at the same time, the <coughs> Articles of Confederation came before the Constitution, and most of that was probably more solid than uh, the Constitution, State. except for maybe the um, the actual money itself. But yeah, the Constitution is a joke, honestly. I think that the Articles of Confederation are a much better idea. But state right. government is not a good idea. It's okay. a better idea than federal government, but not not by much. Right, right. It's still a government. It's yeah. still a slave trade. <laughs> my my problem with constitutionalism was I didn't want to let it go. I'm a, the veteran thing comes into play and all that, and I I just wanted that to be my sacred, you know, the sacred document that I I thought it was or whatever. And right, right. Once I read Spooner, just peace, all done. The, my old show was called The Currency of Democracy, and part of my set, I had an actual set. It was a, it was a show in a studio, and I had uh, the Constitution behind me, <laughs> and, you know, because I believed that. You know what I mean? I believed that we should abide by 
you know, some piece of paper that was written 250 years ago. That doesn't make sense. Sounds awfully like the Bible. It, it does. <laughs> you know, and, and some of the Bible makes sense too, but again, it's it was made thousands of years ago. <laughs> Not all of it's going to make sense, and <laughs> you can't believe it. It's a belief. It's a belief. It's mm -hmm. unfortunate. But, uh, yeah, the sentiment, again, the sentiment of the Constitution made sense. The, or, excuse me, <laughs> the, the sentiment of the Revolution, I should say, and maybe the Articles of Confederation, maybe. It's the putting into it the idea that you have a life, you should have liberty, because that is what makes life. Um, and the only way to have happiness is through your liberty, which is property, proper rights. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, then it, all of that makes sense. It's just it's strewn about in uh, <coughs> government. And then what? Six years later, we have the whiskey rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, time frame, my time frame might be a little off there, but that's about right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, the uh, the whole thing is there was uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts, and that was, uh, was that propagated by Thomas Jefferson and Everybody Loves Him, I believe? That doesn't make it. No, 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 it was um, John Adams or something. Oh, Adams, okay, no, yeah, I think you're right. I'm going to fact check. And, what are we talking uh, about? Alien and Sedition Well, I'm just being, right, the Alien and Sedition Acts, and then there was... Um, some kind of piracy thing with uh, Thomas Jefferson, and he became like an absolute authoritarian for like four years, and then he became himself again or something. <laughs> or that's that's Not the way it's put across. Do you mean James Madison? No, I'm I'm still thinking it's Thomas Jefferson, but James Madison did create the Constitution, so he was a Federalist. And oh, he was a Federalist, and he fl he, he was a flip-flopper, really, your classic flip-flopper, if you want to go from um, the, uh, not the Articles, uh, the Federalist Papers, right? He wrote he wrote Fed 10, and then just completely flip-flopped, you know, mm -hmm. which was like the biggest, the num one of the main reasons the Constitution was ratified in New York. So. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, but, you're, yeah, you're in uh, the state that held out on the Constitution the longest, as far as I know. All right, look, I'm not proud on, of Rhode Island, to be honest. We, uh, we, we're, we're pretty blue here, but we do have some cool things. Like, yeah, we skipped out on the Constitutional Convention. When Prohibition hit, we had nothing to do with it. We didn't even play along. Um, as far as blue states go, we probably have the best gun laws. There was also uh, a mini-anarchy uh, for some time in Rhode Island. Well, that's the way we started, you know. Rhode Island started with uh, Roger Williams leaving Massachusetts over over uh, religious um, 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 persecution. persecution, right? And yeah, the R Rhode Island started as a you know religious con anarcho anarcho con conclave, and, and right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Sheppy, where are you from? I'm from Wisconsin. Oh yeah. man, you're way out there. Yeah. Josh, where are you, Matt? Nowhere. nowhere. <laughs> yeah, Lowell, uh, Lowell, Mass. I was in uh, Danvers, some uh, doing the old show in Danvers. Um, I used to live in Salem. Um, uh, yeah, I've been here almost all my life. I went to college in Connecticut. Um, you got. Uh, the University of Hartford. Oh, cool. It's actually on the outskirts of Hartford. I don't know why they call it Hartford. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, so what else do we have to talk about today? Uh, I'm thinking about um, corporations and licensing for a little bit. What do you think? Hey, I, uh, yeah, um, it, the thing with corporations, I mean, a lot of you know, constitutionalists will say that the government is a corporation itself, and in a sense it is, but it's not. I, I think people get a little uh, stir-crazy or just plain crazy. Um, but a corporation is a figment of the government. It is uh, created by the government, and the only reason why there's uh, little li liability 
with a corporation is because it's created by the government and the government protects it. You're paying uh, a big fee up front and major taxes, but hey, you get protected. Um, and so that's where licensing comes in as well. Um, you know, there were uh, only so many uh, alcohol licenses per town, and there's only so many. <laughs> yeah, do that again. Do that again. I'll put it on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Cheers. So, uh, yeah, alcohol licensing, uh, hairdressing licensing, and uh, licensing to drive a car in the first place. Uh, that's basically corporate. It's kind of an extortion if you drive too fast on their roads. Um, you know, it's it's just a monopolization. Uh, that's what a government is. Corporations become monopolies only because the government exists in the first place. So, in freedom, there wouldn't be such a thing as monopoly, at least not for long. Well, that's you know, not entirely correct, actually. Right, not not for long. I mean, oh. the thing is, if a corporation created a new innovation, or a, excuse me, a business right. created yeah, a, a, a natural innovation. monopoly where somebody innovate or invent something new that would that could actually exist, but right. it wouldn't but exist not for long. long. Yeah, exactly, and then. Uh, the thing is, the the only way a monopoly could exist otherwise is if that industry is dying. So if that innovation got superseded by some other innovation, then eventually that uh, first thing will just wear out and it's gone. Like the roads, that should be gone. It should already <laughs> have been gone like 50 years ago. Um, <laughs> uh, just for an example. You know Where we're saying? going, we don't need roads. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the, so corporations create uh, a monopoly, and uh, or excuse me, governments create a monopoly through corporations, and that used to be called mercantilism, but now it's corporations because that started with the East India Company in 1600 on the dot. By the way, um, but yeah, anyone want to add to that? Well, um, Milwaukee is kind of a strange city. Um, they've got severely limited uh, taxi <coughs> licensing, which is why uh, services like, uh, what is it? Uh, Uber? Yeah, Uber and uh, whatever the other ones are. They, taxi, they're there's like, there's like, well out here. It's, it's like Bitcoin now, man. There's, there's hundreds. It's oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. But, uh, yeah, they're doing pretty well out here. Um because aside from taxis, the only public transportation is the bus system, which is really, really convoluted out here. Like, they have, like, two separate routes that have the same number. It's it's just really confusing. But, uh... And, and that's a public thing, right? Yeah, that's that's through the state. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if a quote-unquote private company owns the bus system. Yeah, that's kind of how... Organized, but... I, t I use public trans to get to school every day. It's uh, it's kind of like your, it's kind of like the Federal Reserve to be quite honest. It's like a federally protected, federally mandated private company. Yeah, right. So it's yeah. not not really a private company, but they can be able to call it that. I guess. Yeah, I take the bus home from school, but uh. Oh, the yeah. MTBA. The MTBA is way worse, man. Are you yeah. sure? <laughs> where, the, the, where Josh is, the bus system up there? Oh my God, man, it's terrible. The MBTA, yeah, um, we have uh, we have public buses as well. But uh, the funny thing is, in the Lowell or the Greater Lowell area, we have the L uh, L uh, I forget uh, LRTR or something like and that. Are you talking about a town a town wide bus system? Um, more like the greater Lowell area. Like, this goes all the way down to Burlington, for example. Um, and so that's actually a pretty wide range. But um, it is it was instantiated by the government, but at the same time, it's supposed to be a corporation. Um, so they can call themselves whatever they want, whenever they want, pretty much? Say that, yeah. There's like it's like a weird hierarchy. Like, there's three companies that own this thing, or something, but at the same time, it's actually the government. So it, 
basically, you could say that's absolute fascism. RIPTA, the Rhode Island Public Transportation Authority, basically can be private when it suits them. They can be public when it suits them. They can be government when it suits them. They can be a corporation when it suits them. Right. All of the above, they, they hit all the criteria for all of them, and they can use whichever one at their disposal when it, when it meets their agenda. Yeah. It's kind of sick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Sheppy, did you have anything else? Um, yeah, I was uh, trying to go into, like, the, the taxi, like, there's a very limited supply of uh, taxi licenses. Yeah. And, uh, like, very, very strict. Then, like, you, you have to pay, like, 150 grand just to get one. Um, wow. Yeah, and, and they're all in the hands of just a few people with, with basically not necessarily a monopoly on on taxis, but, you know, it's like a uh, triopoly. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a cartel. Yep, yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, like, all, all of these other services are doing pretty well. Plus, like, the cost of getting a taxi out here, it, it's like 40 bucks to go 10 miles. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it's, the prices are pretty bad around here as well. Um, I was uh, I was a taxi driver for one month, and I was getting thirty dollars um, a day, and I was working twelve hours. The prices were still pretty bad. Like if I uh, drove someone thirty miles, well, thirty miles, more like twenty miles, that was seventy dollars, eighty dollars, and I didn't get a tip because it was so high. You know what I mean? Uh, right. I, don't blame, I don't blame them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why I left. <laughs> I would see you as more. So, of a limo, I would see you as more of a limo driver than a taxi driver. Yeah, I could do that. You have, you have, <laughs> gosh, you have class. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's the collar. It's the collar. I think. <laughs> oh, so if I went like this. Oh. Yeah, baby. Um, yeah, how you doing? <laughs> no, uh, no, like uh, the whole thing with the corporation thing. It's it. Almost everything is uh, real fascism now. Um, you know, you it's got a mix of public and private, um, and that's how they like it. That's how. The ones that really control the market really like it because it it's not that they don't like playing the game. They just want to win the game. You know what I mean? Well, right. they, they, they won the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry to break it to you, man. Oh, no, absolutely. No, they won. Uh, now we just got to end the game and reset. reset yeah, the pretty board. much. Uh, what was that Dane Cook joke where he flips the, flips the Monopoly board with his grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say the word. Word. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, we basically got that in the bag. Um, you know, Corporations I bring are legal the subject. entities. They only exist because of government. We all, I think we all know that. We know that, yeah, exactly. Um, but a lot of people don't. And the, the point of this show is more like a basic 101 kind of show. Um, but at the same time, you know, I do go over this over and over again. So, um, yeah. Uh, what about um, let's talk about silver and gold a little bit. Uh, first, I'll uh, go over the prices. Uh, all right. So um, last time I took these prices was uh, October twentieth uh, at eight thirty-seven, and tonight I took this at eight thirty-three. Uh, so. Last week silver was 17.40. Tonight it's 17.08. That's a change of 32 cents. So uh, we went down 1.8 percent. Gold uh, went from 12.59.90 to 12.23.06. That's a 36.84 drop. That's uh, a 2.9 percent change, almost 3 percent. Uh, and Bitcoin went down quite a bit. From 378.75 to 350.52, uh, 
and that is a change of 28.23 uh, percent change of 7.5 percent. So uh, yeah, that's kind of a big change, and uh, I think that uh, Bitcoin still seems unstable, a little more unstable than I thought. But um, people are saying that it's you know evening off a bit, and I kind of doubt it. It's still got a couple years to go, but it's it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, excuse me. So uh, I just wanted to talk about the fact that silver is so low and is the lowest it's been in a few years, and same with gold. So I've been buying quite a bit, um, and I'm going to show off tonight again. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is a dollar coin, or what used to be a dollar, I think. No, it used to be $35, excuse me, in 70, uh, 1971, I think. Uh, so a $35 coin is now uh, uh, 1223.06. That coin right there. A $35 coin used to be. Uh, and now they're marketing it as a $50 coin. But anyway, it, on the market, it is $1,223.06, one ounce of gold. So, I mean, the point is, I guess what I'm trying to get at is to drive into some people's brain that this has real buying power. One coin, this is one thousand dollars in our today's dollars you know um, and I have other things I'd like to show I'm glad I brought a screwdriver so I can open my box here <laughs> <laughs> pry it open uh, so yeah I've oh so by the way the, I only have one of these on hand but I have about a hundred of these <clears throat> These are silver dollars. These are actually marked as one dollar. And these are seventeen dollars in today's dollars. So this has a lot of buying power as well. Um, and I expect these to you know rise in the next couple of years, if not sooner than that. Uh, Corey expects this to go up in a couple of years. Um, anyway. So, yeah, I have more being shipped to me right now um, because, you know, I trust silver much more than a government, much more than a bank note. Even if it were a private bank note, I wouldn't trust that either because, you know, that can be inflated. People will, um, you know, fractionally reserve. Um, you know, and there are arguments for and against fractional reserve banking, and I get that. But really, I'd like to make sure that my money is being stored somewhere if I trust them to do it in the first place. Maybe I'll just hold it myself now. You know what I mean? Even if it is cash, actually. But I'd rather not have cash. I'd rather have silver. I'd rather have gold. And, um, you know, you'd rather have Bitcoin. Absolutely. Bitcoin's a great idea. Can you speak to that? I like... You know, I don't only like Bitcoin. I, I do. I really support the fact that my biggest thing with Bitcoin is that it's, well, there's two. It's decentralized. There's no central planning happening here. But my, my real big one is that it's competitive. It competes with the United States dollar, unlike silver or gold, in a new way that is, is a, the, maybe the final frontier, you know. And... And I think that's beautiful. I also have some silver. I, I, I don't have $1,000 of gold like you do or anything like that. But <laughs> I, I'm looking into it. Um, yeah, yeah. This really good website that I wanted to try to plug, to be honest, and this is the best time to do it, um, called Amagi Metals. And they accept Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Darkcoin, Litecoin. They, ex they accept precious metals if you want to trade them you know, silver for gold or gold for platinum or whatever. They'll do that too, and it's uh, amagimetals.com. You guys should really check that out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just think Bitcoin's uh, it's a new thing, and it's it's really really a beautiful thing. I'm just starting, honestly, this morning started really looking into 
into getting into alternative coins, you know, Doge, Dark, Light, Max, Frog, whatever. Um, yeah, that, that's my big thing with Bitcoin. I don't really invest exactly. I don't do the paper wallet thing and put a bunch of money away because I don't really have a bunch of money, <laughs> to be honest. I'm just a, an activist, right? Mm. But uh, I, I, ma I mainly use it for online purchasing. Um, we buy our dog food online every month, and, and you know I bought my shoes online this past, past month, and, and that's basically what I use Bitcoin for right now. Um, but I think it's a beautiful thing, and I know there's a debate to be had as far as current value versus two months ago versus three years ago, you know, that whole thing, but from, and I, I'm not the best investor or the most educated at watching the scales, but from what I understand, we're probably looking at, at, a, at an upstream pretty quick here, and... If you if you like freedom and 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 you like to do what you want to do and not be messed with by the government, Bitcoin is something you should really really look into. Absolutely. That's what I do. Yeah, I think um, there are arguments to both, and I appreciate both honestly. Um, the principle behind all th like all silver, gold, whatever metal, or Bitcoin or whatever. Uh, alternate currency you want, um, they're all valid because it's not created by the government. It's, well, that's I, I think that currency is anything that anyone places value in that anybody else wants. This beer right here could be worth more than your gold to you if you're an alcoholic in withdrawal. Or if you're starving, Absolutely. my sandwich could be worth more than your computer. You know, To me, comic books are worth more than everything ever, 100% of the time, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I I don't think that objective values exist to be honest, but if they do, they definitely don't don't apply to currencies. Uh, right, they don't. Uh, objective value does not. No, value does not objectively exist. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. But you can measure it with prices. That's all prices are. They're a measurement of value. That's all it is. So it's um. It's supply and demand. It's that simple. But, um, yeah, you're right. Like, at any given point, you could want a beer at any uh, time, um, or you would want gold at a different point in time. You know, that's what it is. That's a time preference or an opportunity cost. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is no objective value. There is no intrinsic value at all, I don't think. So, uh, yeah, Sheppy, what do you got? Do you agree or disagree? I would agree. Um, nothing's really, uh, nothing really actually has value. It's what people perceive. Like, right. it, it all comes down to personal preference. And, right. um, like, to people, you know, in third world countries, a U.S. dollar is worth a lot. But... Yeah. Here, well, I, you know, people piss, piss away a dollar. I'd think in a third world country, something like water or bread or a a roof would probably be worth more than a than a USD. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you can get a lot more for a US dollar elsewhere than you can in the United States. Um. Well, the whole thing is, you're, you guys are talking about, um, you, you need to uh, think about each individual. Like, there will be individuals in a third world country that will want a dollar over uh, shelter. Uh, why? Because that's the way they think. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, but that's the whole point of economics. You can't... You can't know what any one individual is thinking at any point. You could speculate, but so that's where the price mechanism comes in, I think. You know what I'm well, saying? Well, yeah. Like, it, if I sell you a rope for a dollar, you obviously value the the dollar more than you value, or other way around, sorry. Uh, you obviously value the rope more than you value the dollar, 
There it is. I value the dollar more than you than I value the rope. So, like, it, it, it all comes down to preference. Everybody's got their own perspective. Yeah. Subjective value theory? Oh, yes, yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's true. It's uh, so we're talking economics now. I, I didn't mean to get into that, but uh, good stuff. Um, so, but what it comes down to is human action. You can't, uh, you you can't know what anyone's thinking, but um, yeah, it's all subjective. Uh, that's all preferences, and I think we can all agree on that uh, as anarchists. Oh, yeah. uh, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, th I think... Um, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> you guys know what I'm thinking. Um, so <laughs> I think we do know what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I like my shirt. Uh, you guys uh, have silver... Uh, you guys want to buy my shirt? It's gonna take a million bucks because it's a good shirt. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, let's talk about um, how this incorporates into corporations a little bit um, because this raises prices. When uh, I'm sorry, uh, corporations. When uh, you know, for example, um, HMOs. Because they all monopolized to a degree, uh, the prices went up. Because they all uh, had uh, the government require uh, everyone to buy health insurance, then the prices went up. Because there are going to be more people in the hospitals, and so there's going to be more demand, and the supply is still the same, so the prices went up. You know what I'm saying? Um, Demand increased, supply stayed the same, so prices are going to go up. Right. So essentially, they're doing the same amount of work but getting more money. Well, I no, I think that they're doing what? more work because you know demand increased and their facilities haven't increased. So I'd say that they're doing they're doing more work, but they're doing less quality work. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, I'll agree with that, yeah. Right. Well, you could also say that it's actually... Um, it could be the same work because they were still accepting people even without health insurance. Right. You know, um, and they, they would get paid by, uh, you know, straight from the pocket as opposed to through the insurance companies. Well, well, think of it this way. When, when Sheppy says increased uh, demand, right, um, let's say you're, a, you're an IT guy, I think, but let's say you're a, an auto mechanic, right, and instead of six cars per day, you have 55. Is your quality of work going to be, this, going to be constant when you have 55 cars to work on in, in X period of time rather than six? I don't think so. Right, right. I understand. Um, it's just I'm thinking, how can they get through all of those people? Um, I, I guess all I'm saying, I understand what you're saying. You know, they're doing less. Uh, they're uh, uh, they're getting the same. Uh, they're they're not doing the same amount of work, but maybe they are doing the same amount of work, just less quality work. Right? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, I get that. My apologies. No, you're fine. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, the principle remains. Uh, the uh, price went up, uh, and so we're paying more, or, uh, well, actually, we must be paying more because we're still paying uh, the insurance companies, and we're paying co-pays and blah, 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 whatever. Um, we might even be paying more out of pocket anyway. Um, anyway, so uh, all I'm saying is they're getting more business and they're getting more money and uh, that's fascism. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and essentially the only real way they, they can get away with this is with the Federal Reserve 
uh, instantiated, I think. Uh, it's just like with uh, Social Security, that whole scheme can only exist with an inflated dollar. Um, would you guys agree with that? Hmm. I don't know. I've never really thought about it that way. Hmm. Um, I'd have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I, I just think that it's uh, near impossible to uh, uh, tell people they have to pay uh, an insurance company. And it, I guess what I'm saying is it's a private entity and uh, if they if the if the government were to supply this uh, they could do it with hard money but not for long and uh, that um, program would collapse pretty quickly um, and everybody would know it and it just it would die off but where it's private uh, I think it's able to last longer especially with uh, an inflated dollar. Uh, the fiat currency, I guess, is one of the price, precise term. Why do, you think it's, <clears throat> why do you think it's able to last longer private versus government? Um, because I think that if it were hard money, um, or no, if, if it were public, excuse me, um, then there would still be those that were conservative with the government, like they would uh, fear the government or whatever, especially with a, um, uh, a hard, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, I, I don't know. I, the, the thing is, it's just hard to see this uh, requirement lasting with a hard currency in the private sector is what I'm saying. Well, I don't think that you're going to be... The mandation there is not going to be able to happen in a free market. The government can point guns at you and can threaten to put you in a cage if you don't buy this product, right? Where the free market can't do that. Right. But I'm saying if... Uh, I'm saying economically like monetarily, uh, you know, they can force people to buy it all they want, but it won't last long um, because all of the money, like really, uh, that would turn into a bubble and um, the, I think the only time that mandates have ever happened have been with a fiat currency in the United States at least. Now that I think about it, I haven't really researched it. Yeah, I can't I, I really can't weigh in on that one. Hmm. I next week ne next time I'm on we should talk about that. We should both look into it. Yeah, yeah. I've just yeah. Mind experiments, that's all. <laughs> um yeah, so uh, we've got about five minutes left. What do you guys want to talk about? Um Gamergate's always fun. Oh jeez. <laughs> Into that yet? Just don't. Just, just don't. Just don't. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> uh, um. What's a good one right now? Uh, a lot of people are so bent on this feminism crap in general that um, maybe a little bit more than uh, they really should be. I think. Both sides. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Mhm. Mm it's, it's an old debate. It's a long debate, and. I think it's kind of useless um, because I th I think there's a uh, bigger fr fish to fry and yeah I am okay I don't like isms other people give me isms all the time I try not to give them to myself the few like the one I'll give to myself is abolitionist I, I happily accept that one um, but I. I'm probably a brutalist, I think, and and when I say hu humanitarian, I don't I don't mean like the Jeffrey Tucker school of thought, though I do really like Jeffrey Tucker. He's he's a brilliant guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when it comes to genders and gender roles and all that crazy stuff, I believe in in humanism. I I believe in humanity, not 
segregating genders and, 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 and breaking it down that way. I think that feminism is for the empowerment of women. I think that you know men's <laughs> rights movement or men right advocacy groups are for the power of men. No, not, not even, they're just more for like stopping feminists and not really doing anything themselves. They just want to stop feminists, which is kind of the, the opposite side of the spectrum, but exactly the same thing at the same time. Mm. Uh, I want well, to promote human. I want to promote human equal. I want to promote human freedom and human equality, not not for a specific gender, right, right, or uh, a transgender, I, whatever anybody wants to you know call themselves, which is fine. Yeah, I see myself as you know an egalitarian. I don't like to take on like feminism or anything like that. Like it, it doesn't matter what your beliefs are. You should have equal rights. Yeah. Not that I even really believe in rights, because you can't point to a right. No, but I, uh, <laughs> I can. That shirt. That shirt is right. Yeah. In front of you, you <laughs> kind of paper, but uh, it doesn't mean that you know anybody's gonna hold that to any degree, and it doesn't defend itself. We have a lot of evidence to to, uh, to back up the fact that they're not going to. Yeah. Um, Let me tell you about uh, rights. They stem from property. It's simple. Proper right. Proper is equal to right in English. Property equals rights. You know what I'm saying? Um, if you own something, you have the right to it. Yeah. That's it. It's arguable, I that guess. Is, that is Depending arguable. I would thought. boil that down to, to mean... Self ownership. Agreed. That that yeah. is probably my basis of rights. I don't need that exact word. I don't need the the NAP to to describe that. I own my body is mine, and I'm going to do with it what I see fit. If I want to own property with it, if I want to consume something or do anything that doesn't hurt anybody else, we are all good. Yeah, yeah. That's how I. See oh it. yeah. But, um, That's definitely where I I lie in my preferences as well. I think the it's very true. foundation of ownership of property rights is owning yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Well, there, there's just you know there are people out there who won't see it that way. Sure. I mean. Uh, and I don't. I don't care. Their own preference and like it. That that's part of the reason I I don't believe in rights per se is you yeah. know, like. It, if there were. If everybody agreed on it, you wouldn't need to call it a right, because you know, every would everyone would just agree, and you know nobody would uh, try and infringe on that. But uh, you know, there there's a million different worldviews out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have to have this debate, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Um, I think we're all basically in agreement here. It's not a big deal. Oh yeah. We're talking about definitions at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah nobody. <laughs> definitions. Well, they're the key to debates. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's true. But uh, yeah, uh, the the thing is with um, property, I I I do agree with that. I do uh, abide by that standard um, because the opposite of right is wrong, and arguably, in my opinion. The only wrong is theft, and you know there are branches to it, like murder and other things like that. So, if you know what is wrong, then you know what's right. Or if you know what's right, then you know what's wrong. It's you know vice versa. Um, that's all. I'll leave it at that. Um, but um, I forget the actual point to my <laughs> ramble as usual. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, I think it has a lot to do with um, what's in your soul as well. Like if if you know what's wrong, then don't do it. You know, just simply don't do it. Yeah. That's it. But uh, you know, be yourself. Be be open. Uh, do what you will. You own yourself. You own your body. You own the fruits of your labor. And uh, actually, I think that money is integral to to that. I'm not going to say it's God. Like some people will. You know, praise it honestly, but um, I think it's I think it's integral to freedom, and the more that it is controlled, the more you are controlled. Um, 
and it's unfortunate, but that's at least the paradigm that we have today. Um, well, yeah, yeah. When money is centrally so controlled. It's you know, money, it, money it's should a be a part of power. Well, I think I think Josh said currency, not money, and and I would make an argument to the fact where where I disagree. I think that that money is the end all. Or, I'm sorry, currency is the end all be all. But I need you to understand that I view currency as any anybody places value in. As in this conversation we are having right now is an economic transaction that we are all mutually benef benefiting from. So I do think that, that currency and, and economics is the end all, all be all. Is is, Actually, is is godly. Even more to your point, uh, Thomas Jefferson himself said currency is uh, I'm sorry, information is the currency of democracy. I change that to the currency of anarchy, of course. But yes, I 100% agree with you, Michael. It is probably the most important kind of currency we have. Subjective, information, just if, if data. Not, but, subjective value is extremely important. If you're not acting out of self-interest, which is economics, then sign your donor card and yeah. eat a bullet and do the world a favor. If you're not working in your best interests, work in others. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're just talking about human action, and all human actions are economic, no matter what they are, even if you're going to the bathroom. I mean, it's it's, it's a form of action. You need to do, do it, you know? It, that's, anyway. Uh, but, yeah, uh, now that we have the potty humor dispersed <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> that's the end of the show, guys, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Joe or Sheppy Morgan, uh, thank you for uh, being on the show, and I'll absolutely have you on in November. Absolutely, sounds great. All right, and uh, Michael Michael Freeman from Don't Tread on Anyone. Please check out that Facebook page, and uh, it's pretty key. And yeah, thank you very much, Michael, once again. I live to serve the empire, bro. <laughs> oh, bad, 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 bad boy. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> uh, the next show will be um, in November uh, on Monday, uh, I think the 4th. Uh, so, yeah, check it out, and uh, that'll be 9 o'clock Eastern. Please check us out, and uh, take care, everybody.